On today's episode of the Wanderings and Wool Gathering podcast, we ponder the impact of music and musicians, we discuss Eminem and MGK again, and we add a few points to the drinking game. Welcome to Wanderings and Wool Gathering, episode four. Tonight's episode brought to you by Small Giant Designs. We're going to kick off the show tonight with JPP bringing us the challenge. What you got, JPP? Well, we talked last week, and the challenge was essentially if certain artist or music didn't exist, then another form of music wouldn't exist. Um, Had it not been for X, we would not have Y. So I want to ask both of you gentlemen what you came up with in the answer, and I'll answer last. Sounds good. Steve, do you want to lead off? Sure. Um, I went uh, old school on mine and I don't know uh, with that little introduction you gave right there that something would not exist. However, uh, the route that I went was with Richard Wagner and, um, I know you guys know I'm a pretty big, you know, star Wars fanatic since I was a little kid. Um, without Mm -hmm. Wagner, we would not have the music that we have for movies today. Um, he created, um, what he called, well, what people called for him, the light motif, uh, which was the musical representation of people and object and places and, and ideas and state of mind and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and he did it in his ring cycle, which if you ever listen to that, it's some serious, uh, opera. Um, and of course I can't understand a word, but the music is, is so amazing. <laughs> But you can see it in everything. It started, you know, they used it in Gone with the Wind. Um, it's gone through all different movies. And for me, obviously, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Lord of the Rings, they all use it. So the idea being that it's a, a piece of music that recurs throughout the movie. And it will, that, that music will play while a character is on scene. Or in the case of Star Wars, when you see Darth Vader or something on the dark side, you get this strident, brooding march, you know. Um, and then you get Luke, you know, and you get this, uh, this kind of heavenly strings, you know, that show he's innocence and and it repeats every time he's on screen and, and Obi-Wan is real mysterious and the music's kind of nostalgic and Yoda's got that mischievous song, but every time they're on the screen, it returns and it brings you a feeling about the characters and you don't even know what's happening. And that's the beauty of it. You know, if, if you're drawn to the music, it's not necessarily a good thing when you're in a movie because it's just supposed to accompany what's going on and, and put that feeling on you. And, um, without Wagner, I don't know that we would have that today. And I'd say it's fairly safe to say if Wagner was alive today, that he probably would be writing scores to movies. So that is my answer. What you think? I love it. And to expand on that, I don't know um, how familiar you or the listenership is to uh, Gustav Holst, The Planets. Mm -hmm. Um, That series of works uh, has a lot of similar rhythmic motives to a lot of what John Williams did in the Star Wars uh, soundtrack as well. So to further embellish upon that Mm -hmm. and my inner nerddom, that's what I have. And then I think maybe it might have hit its peak um, in I'm Gonna Get You, Sucker. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. every hero's got to have a theme that's, right. that's exactly right yeah no but that is cool and um i i love seeing the how soundtracks work and i think they've evolved quite a bit anyway just in the expanding outside of the, the normal circle of people that do it but um that whole thing like steve's talking about you know that you have these these like audio kind of mentions i guess to say in, in your mind and, and it's accompanying this person that's like i to me that like takes the art another level deep um and so that's i mean that's a great answer and uh, and like you said the music staying out of the way but also enhancing it i think that's a really tricky thing i paul like as a musician like wouldn't that be a daunting task to like find that little pocket Absolutely. And, you know, I've been studying a lot of uh, composers who score for visual um, as a passion for something I'd like to pursue. And, you know, one thing uh, a video showed the other day was a gentleman 
he was making some pieces for trailers and he basically was saying that the music is constantly asking a question uh, because you don't want to expose the whole film and the whole plot in that trailer. And so the music has to carry on with that essentially. So, you know, I, I totally uh, think that it's a complete challenge. It's uh, more than just writing a, a song to express yourself. You're really trying to serve a whole other medium as well as, you know, make it uh, really captivate the t entire package instead of just a, a piece of it. You know, it's it's more than just doing that piece of work. You're doing the work for the whole. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes you, you know. the music... In a in a situation where you've got you know Luke out on the sand dune looking at the twin sons, there's no dialogue. You can't even see his face. It's behind, but you hear that that music, and it just really gives you that feeling of yearning. You know, he's looking at the the stars, and it really drives the whole scene. And it's not something they're saying. There's no action. It's just simply a still mm -hmm. photo with that music. So powerful. Right. Do you, do you know um, Stevie whether he? Um composed to the footage or to an idea do you know um i know well i i've i've seen them do the music i actually played the music to the movie um i think they build it together because he did work pretty closely with george lucas but i don't know definitively how that worked exactly um but i do know on many occasions uh john williams has given credit to wagner for what what he's doing got you Here's a quick question, not to throw this in the weeds, but um, what modern score ha have you, either of you, um, encountered recently that kind of really, I don't know, maybe gave you chills or really captivated you with the, with the film? Does anything stick out to you? Well, you know I'm going to jump in here <laughs> with mm -hmm. Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, so drink. Um, chug, I chug. Think, yeah. <laughs> no, but when, I, when, uh, when Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross... We're set to do the social network, which is still one. I can listen to that soundtrack um, while I work, and I love it. But when they were set to do that, that was like a perfect storm for me because David Fincher was directing the film, Aaron Sorkin was writing it, and Trent and Atticus were scoring it. And there was a part of me that was just afraid it was going to be too, like, it, at their real first venture, it was going to be too, like, well, let's look at somebody and do what they do so that we have a chance of success. But it was a very, very different soundtrack, <laughs> in my opinion. I think it was a real... I think it's what Fincher wanted, was to bring Trent Reznor to the table, but then, like Steve said with this, push it to the background and just have it enhance mm -hmm. the scenes. And I remember Trent, in one of his interviews, talking about seeing some of the footage with a completely different score underneath it and you know, kind of feeling a little bit daunted of how to go about changing things. And um, But that one, to me, launched uh, oh, the idea that, okay, well in this world where artists are trying to figure out what they do because you can't just sell a platinum record and sit back. Um, it opens doors, you know, and I'm sure Trent Reznor's not the first crossover to do that, but um, mm -hmm. pro as we grew up in the nineties, it was more or less the soundtrack was maybe somebody cultivated and um, commissioned a few bands to write a song for it, you know, and that was more of a soundtrack right. than a score. And so uh, that one sticks out to me. Social network, uh, highly recommended. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because that movie is kind of a stark contrast in terms of the, the type of feel that Reznor would normally do, where the girl with the dragon tattoo makes a lot more sense. Uh -huh. But it's still what he did nailed it. It was really cool because th there was a lot of suspense and mood because it was such a, um, you know, they were driving with, with uh, you know, in the fog with no headlights, right. basically <laughs> coming up with the social network. So it fit the story very well. Yeah, I like that. And then they're set to do uh, like a 90s show uh, that Jonah Hill is doing. And they're also set to do the Watchmen series. So, you know, some more interesting music out of that camp, I think, soon. Totally stoked. Absolutely. What about you, Steve? Yeah. What about you, Steve? <clears throat> Well, for me, uh, the easy answer is uh, Secret Path. It's, um, it was illustrated. It's a story mm -hmm. that was illustrated by Jeff Lemire, who's one of my favorite artists. And uh, the music was composed by Gord Downey uh, from Tragically Hip. And um, what they were doing was uncovering something that had gone on in Canada in their past, and they were trying to bring it to the light where... Um, basically, the church in Canada at the time was trying to civilize the natives that had lived there. And um, the story follows a child who was brought into a school um, to be, I guess, kind of reconditioned, you know, and, and transformed into a civilized person. 
and he escapes and runs home, but the path home is so ridiculously long that he dies along the way. Mm. But the, the, the pictures that he draws, and they put it, they, they make the, the, the images move, and it's to the music by Gord Downey. Um, you, you've got to watch it. I think it's on YouTube, and you can probably check it out. But uh, I watched it with uh, my wife, Marianne, and um, we were just blubbering idiots by the end. It was so sad and um, <laughs> heartfelt. It is truly moving. And the other really cool thing is, this is the last thing that Gord Downey did. Oh. He had uh, brain cancer, and he just fought through it and finished this project. Um, it was so powerful. I bought the, the book and got the downloads and all that. Um, just two amazing creators and what they put together. Um, man, it just hits you. Hits you right in the heart. So that's it for me. Wow. Well, I'll have to check that out yeah, for sure. I'll be checking out our own show notes just to get the link mm-hmm. to that. So, yeah, we'll have to share. Definitely. Um, I'll keep the for challenge me, moving. Unless, oh, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to say the, the one score that recently captivated me, it's yeah. it's it complete 180 from the, both of you, but um, the Avengers, the, the main theme, um, b- just because the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done a really good job of of unfolding these characters and building the story. And, and uh, you know, just in the first Avengers movie, when all of them were together before they got to the big fight seat at the end and, and they started playing that theme, I was just like, wow, this is like the first piece of music that's hit me vi- with the visuals like this in a, in a while. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch as many movies as I used to just being you know a busy dad and such but it's uh, very cool to see how those themes from those movies kind of play on through the stories too especially with the latest Avengers and um, just the the overall sound and, and vibe that that creates amongst the tension and the comic relief at the same time there's a lot of challenges with that and they're doing it very well that's cool I agree yeah. Paul that uh, theme song is it, it just it's uplifting, you know, in the, in kind of the mm-hmm. similar way that the the Star Wars theme song, um, or when you hear that Superman song, it's just an uplifting song, and um, it's really catchy. They did an amazing job crafting that one. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, absolutely. Tony, you want to go on with the challenge? Sorry to derail this whole conversation. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting. I like that we're getting a little bit more in depth. Um, yeah, because now I'm <laughs> I'm I'm taking notes over here. Like I got to listen to stuff that my co-hosts are <laughs> telling me so right um i love it um yeah so for me it was more or less like okay so you guys know but no shock i'm a huge like fan of new orleans and um you know when my wife she was my girlfriend at the time but when my wife bought a plane ticket for us to go there i didn't really know what to expect especially you know america's not very old so it's not like you're going over to see castles or anything like that but New Orleans has quite the history, um, it being taken over by different places or being French owned when we were still, you know, the United States without them, <laughs> uh, part of the Louisiana right. purchase, all that stuff. We won't do a history lesson right now, but, um, but there was a thing called Storyville. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but, um, basically they needed a place to like kind of regulate prostitution and I'm going somewhere with this Paul. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But so that go on uh, this guy named Sydney story, um, you know, basically had this area cordoned off and, and you know, what, these were the boundaries and, and prostitution, although it was illegal, was like, OK, well, it can exist here. We'll kind of look the other way, just kind of like a give and take. And so mm-hmm. and that was like, you know, in the 1900s to, to 1920s, somewhere in there. But what happened then was, you know, art kind of finds its way, especially through those dark paths, I think sometimes. And there wasn't so much care as to who was coming in and who was coming out of the the various businesses, so to speak, you know. And um, and they wanted entertainment. So musicians, and New Orleans is famous for musicians, you know, jazz was being born at the time. But you had that heavy, like, segregation. And so in this particular area, you saw a lot of... Um, desegregation in the sense of musicians you know a band could be comprised of both white and black and so you know talent was able to like speak for itself and it wasn't no one was being judged on skin color no one's being judged period i mean you're in the red light district so um it, it gave birth to a lot of um a lot of different bands a lot of different feels experimentation um things like that so what 
ended up happening was, you know, jazz kind of was born there. I mean, I think little pockets of that was happening in like Chicago and New York when I did some research because the people from New Orleans, when Storyville closed, ended up like kind of migrating out to find work into those cities and bring in their sound there. But, mm-hmm. you know, through that, you got like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, like classic people coming up through at least having some inspiration from that time. Um, and not to mention the fact, and this is where Paul, you'll know a lot more about this, but when I'm tying it into the challenge, like what would exist without it? Well, that's a pretty broad stroke, you know, jazz, but mm-hmm. polyrhythms, uh, when I did more research on this, polyrhythms kind of kept floating up to the top. Like that's a pretty common thing in jazz, which is also now to this day, you know, pretty common thing with tool and nine inch nails and things that I love, totally. you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. even across the board, I read Britney Spears, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of musicians that are using the, using the technique, but, um, because a lot of, um, you know, stupid barriers like, like racism and things like that were in the way at the time, this little pocket of thing gave way to just say like, go do your thing. Like, you know, what's, what happens when music just has a place to exist and, um, follow that all the way through to today. And I think jazz has influenced a ton of people. I think those people I mentioned, I think like Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday were able to pioneer women in music a little bit too. Um, and mm-hmm. you know, if you you probably wouldn't have an Adele if you didn't have that, or a Fiona Apple, or anything like that. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers the challenge, but I think without Storyville and the birth of jazz, you wouldn't have many, many, many things that we have today. No, I can see that for sure. And you know, keep in mind out there, listeners, this is all subjective. I mean, of course, we're trying to pull some uh, history and, and evidence of uh, certain reactions to artists or musicians and things of that sort but by no means don't take this as this is our answer and we're going to you know push it down your throat but no that's a fantastic answer and it's a lot deeper than than i was able to go and i appreciate that because you're right jazz took on many forms from different parts of the country um even what's funny is i found a video of stephen colbert talking about uh childish gambino song favorite song oh yeah and he was analyzing, he's like, I was trying to figure out why I liked this verse so much and why it, it kept st- sticking with me. And he said the rhyme scheme came from a Rodgers and Hammerstein tune. And then on even deeper than that, there was a, a piece in a, a Tolkien book that had the same rhyme scheme as well. So the fact that it was so deeply ingrained in him, mm-hmm. he saw that influence, uh, you know, basically come forth to, to modern hip hop. And it's very clever. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes for those to see as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, to kind of transition quickly into my answer, I was looking a lot in the rock and roll aspect of it. And I found Basically, a lot of artists attribute Muddy Waters, blues in general, but uh, as a a key influence in what they did. Um, Looking at some of the uh, articles, Rolling Stones named the band after his song Rolling Stone. I watched some some live footage of him, and and he certainly had some energy uh, live that I can see rock bands pulling from, you know, the front man kind of uh, uh, presence and things like that. I, I didn't see him really moving around much, but he certainly played on dynamics a lot. Uh, and I think that, you know, rock music took that and ran with it. You look at Mick Jagger, you look at Robert Plant and um, even Corey Taylor, things of that sort. I think that all plays a role. And even guitarists looking at blues music as uh, as an influence, Jimi Hendrix definitely pulled from blues music and then, you know, turned it up to 12 and, and blew up speakers and things like that, and which then turned into Black Sabbath, turned into Metallica, turned into modern metal today, where the distortion is certainly high gain and rips your head off. So all of that is kind of a reaction from that initial uh, sound that was then. Um, you know, long and short, I think that, you know, blues in its simplicity plays a big role in rock because rock in its essence is very driven by a groove, very driven by, you know, a strong statement. And then, you know, having solos and leads and little embellishments that kind of carry the song forward too, much like blues. Yeah, that's, um, (laughs) that's, that's just as in depth, I think. I mean, that's, I don't know that I necessarily drew those conclusions, you know, without hearing your statement that 
blues like dirt was the driving force for rock and roll yeah what's funny is there was a an article i don't know if it was a song title or maybe a dvd i just saw it in my search that said uh blues had a child and its name was rock and roll <laughs> that's, that's absolutely cool. correct yeah and you also could throw in there with muddy waters robert johnson you don't mm-hmm. get oh, yeah. a certainly. more rock and roll story than the guy who went to the crossroads and sold his soul to the devil, you know, to achieve his dreams. I mean, that is a rock and roll story through and through. So, huh. uh, precisely, that's yep. awesome, Paul. Exactly. I love it. Exactly. That was cool. That was cool. All right, fellas, cool. is that it? Is the challenge wrapped up this time? That is the challenge, yeah. yes, sir. Steve, do you have a new one for us this week? I do, but I'm not going to tell you until later. Because that's how I do it. (laughs) Now we'll Well, do that for the folks. Because I cannot wait to get uh, to Tony. Uh, He he had mentioned we were we were texting that uh, he had listened to Machine Gun Kelly. So I quickly hopped in the car and drove to Rochester and listened to to the album as well. But I didn't research. Tony did a little research. So because we have to talk about Eminem and Machine Gun Kelly, or it's not a show. Or Rush. <laughs> Have a drink, folks. <laughs> and um, drink. so let's go ahead and we'll, we'll uh, tackle this new album and, uh, and then we'll move on from there. So, Tony, uh, you've mm-hmm. got a little bit more work on it than we do. So what's your take? Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I, I guess me and probably a lot of other people we're more tuned into Machine Gun Kelly this time around than we ever have been. Like it was, it was a name and a couple of songs prior to this whole beef thing going on. So I was actually kind of excited to listen to it. Um, but not being a fan, I just was like, okay, you know, the spotlight is on you. What are you going to do? And part of me wanted it to have a couple more diss tracks because we were going to then get more from Eminem and uh, things like that. But the only thing on there was rap devil and the rest was, was, you know, not involved with that. So, um, but on first listen, and I, I'll be fair and say that I'll, I'll give it another couple run throughs, but I think it's pretty weak in my opinion. I think it is, um, if you're going to bring it, you know, if you have, this is, this is the time to do it. You have, you don't only have your own fans, but you've got a lot of, you got a lot of media talking about you, you know, that you can't even buy. And then you've got crossover potential from fans um and for me i I don't know steve you can i I obviously want you to weigh in too on this but if take away all of this hype and you sent me that if you sent me the bin gp i'd probably be like oh yeah that was cool and it probably would have got a couple of spins and then that was it i i i listened through it several times in several different scenarios so it wasn't just like me being mad at work or something um and it just there was just nothing that really stood out to me. It was good, and it was good in, in a very average way. That so I would say if we were doing the five star thing, I'd give it a two star. Yeah, I, it was bland for me. Yeah. Um, I didn't think the songs were very dynamic. Uh, they were pretty one note. Um, his voice was pretty much essentially the same all the way through. Mm-hmm. It wasn't terrible. I mean, I didn't hate it when I listened to it, but. Like you said, if I didn't know that this guy was involved with this, uh, you know, feud with Eminem, I would probably listen to it and be like, yeah, whatever. You know, I mean, he's okay. Uh, (laughs) It's kind of like watching uh, America's Got Talent or, you know, The Voice or something like that. Yeah, they're good. Not going to listen to them beyond this, you know, kind of thing. So that's a great point. I'm I'm certainly not sold on it. (laughs) No, and the only other thing I'll say too about that is that. I don't know if you saw the breakfast club interview he did machine gun Kelly did, but he, they were asking him if he was going to retaliate uh, for kill shot. And he said that he had one, he had a clip ready and then he heard it and he just put it back in the holster because Eminem called him a mumble rapper. And he was, he was basically saying, because he did that, I'm not even going to respond because I'm not a mumble rapper. Then he puts out binge and there's <laughs> several cases that could be made for him being a mumble rapper. So, uh yeah i mean i don't know i just don't i don't think he was i don't think he's ready to take on and you know the other thing too like you saw i don't know if you guys both saw it i know i'd sent some stuff out but the whole like fans flipping off the camera while he's wearing the kill shot shirt and blah 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 you know and it was a fallout boy crowd Mm -hmm. and people were saying it wasn't even his crowd and that kind of stuff well all that aside i'm thinking okay so he's an opening act still you know 
at, at what point do you mm-hmm. just admit you would like to be like Eminem, <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, if you really wanted to have a real, real battle, just both of you pick one night, you could be in the same city in two different arenas and see who sells more tickets. Right. No, that's a good point for sure. I- I uh, I didn't get a chance to to give it a listen. I I've been reading some highlights here and there, but I didn't put much more energy past the the initial reactions. Honestly, um, you know it is what it is. I I gave it a a listen, and you know where I stood last week is still the same with the fact that Eminem definitely feels like he plays more uh, characters in in this tune and uh, in in general for that matter. But, um, I just felt like, you know, machine gun Kelly is, uh, developing still. And, you know, there may be potential for him to flourish and, and, uh, unleash a beast that we haven't seen yet, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, going to pursue it further. Yeah. And I, I guess to be fair too, because I'm very much like on the negative side of this review, but I was so excited because I don't think Rap Devil was a bad response for somebody to come at Eminem. And I think, mm-hmm. and there's been other songs of Machine Gun Kelly's that show some talent. So that's what I was just hoping for was like, you would get your team together, know that you have the spotlight on you and you've got Rap Devil as one of your songs. So even if you're not coming out with diss tracks, come out with something that is your best stuff ever. And there's a lot of reviews online when Steve said I did some research that are, you know, on the trash or pass, there's a lot of people saying trash and there's a lot of one and two star reviews and they're just saying that it's just not it that it might actually be the worst thing that he's released so far on his catalog which is unfortunate timing and but again Mm -hmm. art is subjective this might be the the favorite album of some fans and that's that's all that matters really totally and you know what again like we've discussed before somebody may come back to this two three years later and and really find that it stands the test of time it just maybe was ahead of its time i don't know exactly you know what i mean yes i do (laughs) i think you're wrong but i know what you mean um yeah (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) but if you want me to uh tie all this stuff together real quick um sure okay so speaking of having fans that like your album and that means more than sales and speaking of new Orleans and speaking of everything nostalgic that we talk about the fragile came out September 21st of, was it 99? Yep. Okay. And so happy birthday, fragile. (laughs) Yes. And, uh, and I remember when that came out, it debuted really high and then it just dropped off the charts and there was a lot of talk about whether nine inch nails had started to fail and things like that. But, I, it's my favorite album in the entire catalog and mm-hmm. I think it's a genius piece of work. So yeah. What does matter? I mean, what, what do you guys think in that as far as like sales go versus like true fans liking stuff? That's a, that's a loaded question for me. Um, <laughs> I'll start off by saying my reaction to the fragile when it first came out was I was completely floored. Uh, actually today when I was out running around with the family, my daughter was napping in the back of the car, so I had the speakers faded to the front so she couldn't hear it and uh, was listening to, it was actually just kind of in rotation of Nine Inch Nails in general, but uh, the Fragile was pretty heavy uh-huh. in, in that playlist. And, you know, to this day, I still feel really good when I listen to that album just because it, it has a lot of themes that kind of keep playing on themselves, like La Mer versus, uh, uh, shoot, I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but uh, the, let me, I'll look it up and we'll get back to it. But basically, there are some rhythmic themes. There are some melodic themes that, that keep kind of coming back and forth through the album. And um, just the fact that it had a more of a, or more of an organic approach than the previous efforts, too. Everything was real gritty and distorted. You have broken, downward spiral, and pretty hate machine, where this one actually has some nice acoustic piano that plays very well in the, in the songs and, and cello and, yeah. uh, you know, or orchestral bits and things so um yeah i i think that you know people were expecting that that anger that we had before Mm -hmm. trent was going through a a transition in his life and this really spoke to that for him and um you know kind of like again with eminem people's uh jabs about liking his music before he was sober you know what the artist is doing what the artist needs to do Mm -hmm. um but you know looking back now i think people if they are celebrating Nine Inch Nails discography, The Fragile is going to come up on top. I agree. And side note, it was recorded in New Orleans. Why Trent lived in New Orleans? So, yeah, yeah. Music influences through and through. <laughs> Steve, absolutely. Steve, what do you think about The Fragile? Oh, I loved it. 
I I like pretty much all of their albums. Um, I I didn't. I'm still not a huge fan of the recent one, but um, I pretty much love them all. But I wanted to add something because you went back in time to talk about that <clears throat> cool fact yes. that just came out. I was on Reddit the other day, and um, 1991 Metallica, the album, uh, self titled album has been in the Billboard Top 200 for 500 straight weeks. That is insane. (laughs) It is one of only four albums in history to do so. Um, Yeah, that's just crazy. And and that would obviously speak to the success of that album. But I kind of, uh, when you had mentioned that a minute ago, Tony, about um, what makes a good album or you know is it the sales is it the responses from people Mm -hmm. i don't know i mean that's that's a a great question i think we ought to dedicate an entire show to that because you could use movies you could uh you know do tv shows books you know that's a topic that i think we could probably talk about forever so i'm gonna bookmark that one and move it to a later episode if you guys are good with that oh yeah that sounds great to me and listeners if you have any thoughts on that please feel free to weigh in in the comments yeah, exactly. All right. Um, and especially, uh, there's a lot of lists that go around on the internet these days, and there's a lot of like, hey, we're going to take this artist and rank their top whatever. So if there are some Nine Inch Nails fans listening, I'd be interested to see what your like top five albums are in their collection. Or Metallica even, you know, any of, anybody, really. Just uh, what what's a top five? Because I I think maybe when we do do that episode, I said doo-doo. <laughs> when we do that episode, um yeah we should be able to reference things maybe even outside of our circles because I go back to Nine Chanel's all the time. So You said doo-doo, tea bags in his potty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love yeah. uh, the, like, the top ten list. You know, um, quick uh-huh. shameless plug, I write over at Break the Fourth, um, and people love when you do top ten lists because it's easy to weigh in and agree, disagree, whatever. And I had a, a piece where I did the top ten, my top ten favorite Slipknot songs. And um, I get a lot of responses when yeah. I post it on Facebook and Reddit and stuff. So uh, that's that's a lot of fun to do. So maybe in the future we can combine a show with an article or two and, and uh, knock this out. Because the, the reason behind why you rank them is so cool. And that's what I love to hear as opposed to just, uh, you know, we're in my top ten, you know. So Yeah. No, yeah. And when we do get into that show, I think that's exactly what you're saying is like, there's going to be a reason. And time place sound whatever we don't who knows what it is but uh it's that's what that's the one thing i love about art in general is that whole subjectiveness and personal thing and and uh so yeah let's do that for sure agreed awesome and tony you just mentioned art are you a fan of art of arc art with a t (laughs) oh then you're gonna yeah I, I, I like art. <laughs> <laughs> Have you dabbled once or bit. twice? Because I think this challenge is for you. Are you ready? Yes. All right, fellas. Please, yes. Here's the challenge. Okay. What I want you to do is name your best album cover ever. <laughs> and it can be yes. for any reason. No parameters? Like... <laughs> or do you want to do your top five? For what? Um... I don't know. I, I I've said before I'm horribly indecisive. So if you give me a chance to like expand it <laughs> and bring in five over one, I'll do that every day. But if it's gonna make the show too long, mm-hmm. I don't know. We can split the difference and say top three. I'm down with that. All right, Steve, it's your challenge. You no, I'm that? totally good with that because I started thinking about this earlier when um, I was talking to Marianne and uh, we came up with this, and then we were we were gonna go with a part two, and it just it was getting too crazy. So we'll just do top three. Album covers of all time. I like it. Okay. It's going to be fun. And it, is there any specifics? Is it just, I mean, are we talking, we may not like the band, but we like the art? Uh, I'm going to leave it up to you. I mean, your interpretation, right? I mean, that's what art mm-hmm. is. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Data of the East, data of the East Alkalade better make your top three. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'll have to consult my graphic designer on that one. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Side note, T Bags is the graphic designer. <laughs> Side note, another plug, go listen to that damn album, people. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Awesome. Hey fellas. So um 
Outside of Machine Gun Kelly, Tony, you're not allowed to talk about that. What have you guys been listening to this week? Thank God. JPP? <laughs> well, I listened to The Fragile today uh, quite a bit and, uh, you know, kind of went through memory lane there. Through last week's conversation, I went back and listened to the two Smashing Pumpkin singles that uh, we discussed because I missed the, the boat on those and watched the videos. Um, I definitely... Um, song titles are escaping me at the moment. What Solara is one, and the other one was um, Silvery Ghost Sometimes Ghost. Silvery. Ghost. Yeah, sometimes you know something's silvery and and whatnot. So yeah, the uh, um, the second song there, I I really enjoyed both of them. I felt like the the newer single kind of just kind of barreled through. It didn't have a lot of dynamic changes, but I liked the vocal melodies. I liked the way Billy was singing in that tune, the guitar parts were, were lovely. Um, and, and the song had a good groove. Uh, the, the first single, I was very entertained by the song, but also completely entertained by the video. I, I just felt like Billy looked like a, uh, just a grumpy old man trying to get out of that room. It was like, what, what the hell's going on? I, I should be at home watching the sports network or something. You know, it was just, <laughs> just funny to look on his face the whole time. Kind of looked like that meme where he's on the roller coaster and he's just like, what am I doing? But, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and maybe it's the internet, you know, kind of, uh, corrupting my mind, uh, in, into that perception. But, uh, uh, I, I definitely enjoyed that. And then it made me go back and listen to uh, some stuff from Gish and, and Melancholy and, and the Infinite Sadness. So uh, long story short, that's what I've been listening to. Those are both great ones. Steve, you want to <laughs> tell us what you're listening to? Yeah, well, um, I, I definitely did uh, MGK. Um, I even listened to um, Kamikaze again. So I was enjoying that. And um, I listened to a lot of podcasts normally, and I haven't listened to a whole lot recently, but I did listen to the Josta show this week uh, because he had Corey Taylor on. Uh, but I thought uh, there was something interesting on there. Uh, they were talking about Knotfest, and Corey mentioned that they were thinking about potentially doing it as a tour. So, like, one year they would maybe tour the United States and have, you know, 20 stops or whatever. For not fest here and then they would choose another country the next time and do it rather than just having a day here and there where they do it actually doing it as an entire tour so i think that would be a, a pretty cool thing if they would do that so i think that's where i stand i didn't have a chance to listen to a lot of other music this week so darn it i'm letting us down this week so tony you're gonna pick <laughs> us back up right that's okay i, li I listened to enough for the both of us um but I will only mention that's the hardest part, honestly, for me is when we get to this part, I, I don't know that there's really a time I don't listen to music all day long. And so what I'm listening to, I just have to feel like, OK, well, it's not fair all the time for me to say I listen to this because of the review. So what kind of like floated to the top or what was new and introduced to me? So anyway, full disclosure, it'll always be two and sometimes it'll be ten. So. Just be forewarned. But today it's two. Um, my friend Kyle, he's down in uh, Tennessee right now at the Pilgrimage Festival. And he texted me and he said, hey, you got to check out Figure It Out by Royal Royal Blood. And I have... Um, oh, man, I love that band. I'd never, I'd never heard of it. Oh, yeah. So I check it out. The video is cool, too, by the way. Um, and it's got a very Jack White sound to the, to the vocalist, I think. But uh, it's a good mm -hmm. like kind of rock and roll sound i liked it a lot yeah so uh figure it out was one and uh, i just started listening to that today but it's something that went into my playlist for that'll be getting a lot of heavy rotation and then um in the research of doing the challenge and you know, talking about polyrhythms and things like that I, I think tool is one of those bands that just has every single person in the band has more talent than one person should mm -hmm. <laughs> and the way that they can work together so i went back and listened to lateralis which is my favorite album by them um, so, but that song particularly is my favorite, well, not my favorite, but it's, it's one of the best songs on, on the album, I think. And, um, also if you get a chance and we'll put a link, but Paul, I think I've sent it to you before the time signature changes in like schism. I think they change like 56 times or something like that within the song. Yeah, I have seen that. And, uh, kudos to the person that had a lot of free time to put that together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, uh. I, I mean, and I'm a lyrical person, Steve, and I talk about that a lot of times. So, Lateralis by Tool, um, 
I will say it like kind of really is something that drove me this week mentally and emotionally too. So those are my two. Very cool. Um, Royal Blood. Did you see the lineup of that group? No, who is it? I don't know anything about them. Um, I don't know their names. There's just two guys and uh, a okay. drummer. And then the singer plays bass guitar and he runs through two different amplifiers, one with a pitch shifter that runs the bass an octave up. So it sounds like a guitar part and a bass player, a bass part at the same time. So it's just mm. thick, meaty, and and brutal. Um, the the single that I heard for, the, for you know when my first listen with them, it, it uh, definitely gave me the Maxell effect. I was blown away. Um, <laughs> if you get a chance to dig further, I highly suggest it. Okay, Steve, have you heard them? What was the single you heard? What was it, Tony? Figure it out. You said. Yeah, figure it out. All right, I just gotcha. pulled it up oh, here, okay. and uh, uh, I've got it on Apple Music pulled up, so I'm ready to roll. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, um, ha- have you heard them before, Steve? No, I hadn't, so this would be cool. I'm always excited for new tunes. Uh, yeah, so I think it's Out of the Black is the the single that I first heard. Okay. Um, just real heavy and, and just a good driving groove. Nice. Yeah, Steve, I think you'll really like them. It sounds exactly like something you would like, so if you if you don't, I'd be shocked. I'm going to check it out the minute we get off here. But I actually lied to you guys okay. because I did listen to something else this week. A little song called Subdivisions by Rush. A band maybe you haven't heard of before. Now, actually, I just played it to annoy my <laughs> wife because she hates Rush. So <laughs> I did that to her tonight. And I'm all out of beverages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need, to, we need to keep reiterating that anytime you say Rush, people need to drink. And anytime I say Nine Inch Nails... We need one for Paul. Yeah, Paul. no kidding. Oh, uh, well, for me, we, yeah. we said anytime I got technical, that was going to be a, a drink for sure. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, You've I guess pretty good, you know, if, anything, uh, you know, as far as the electronic dance music, be it uh, Aphex Twin or Bjork or anything like that, that'll be my, uh, that'll be my shot worthy note. Yeah. He says sugar okay. cubes, then you've got to take two shots. That's exactly right. <laughs> and if I mention Green Glow, it's the third one. That's deep cuts on Bjork. <laughs> Speaking of deep cuts, this is and drinking when I say Nine Inch Nails. Um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but Nine Inch Nails on this new tour have been pulling out the stops and playing like All the Love in the World off of With Teeth, which never gets played, and Perfect Drug, that which never gets played. And they, they opened one show playing the entire Broken EP, including the bonus tracks um, in sequence. Wow. Um, I know, Paul, I think you sent out that text to us that someone was complaining because they, want, they wanted their money back because they didn't play closer that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, if and I, I, yeah. <laughs> and mm. I said, what, what was that? I said, it's like, because you and I saw him in Muncie that night and he had the flu and so he stopped the show early and it's like, well, mm. technically we didn't get to see closer either. I want my 12 bucks back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 12 bucks, that's but, cute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, actually, a buddy of mine was at the Red Rock show, and uh, he saw Perfect Drug pulled off. And I've seen a couple different videos. There's a second video where the, the person recording was a little closer to the stage, and just uh-huh. watching the the drummer pull those break beats off, I was floored. Oh yeah, I mean that's a weird thing to be able to do. I remember watching a, a YouTube video of some kid um, playing the drum part, and I never thought it could be humanly possible to do. So, I guess. Uh, you know, challenge accepted by Nine Inch Nails <laughs> to play yeah. their own stuff live. Uh, yep. It sounded great. I think Trent and the whole group uh, sound fantastic. And I'll know more because I will be at the show next weekend. You guys both are going to be missing out, and I will rub it in your face next weekend. Yeah, please do. Well, <clears throat> fellas, I think that brings us uh, near the end of the show. But uh, exciting news for the next episode because September 28th, next Friday, Cypress Hill is releasing a new record. So... I believe we yes. will be uh, listening to that to the best of our ability and discussing that on the next episode. You guys in? Sounds good. Yeah, very cool. Looking forward to that for sure. And also, as a side note, if you haven't heard, um, uh, there's a super group out with Sendog called Power Flow. Definitely check it out. It's got Billy, the guitar player from Biohazard. Christian Wolbers was the bass player from Fear Factory. There's a couple guys from Downset in the group as well. And then Sendog is the vocalist. Uh, very heavy, very, you know, kind of rap rock driven, but in a good way. It's very uh, powerful stuff. Cool. I will check that out. Excellent. So, all right. Paul, any place new we can find you this week? Uh, still the same old places. Uh, just plain Paul. You Google that. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even Snapchat. Sometimes I get on there and, and show some keyboard musing. So if you want to see some music in action, go there too. 
Fantastic. Where can we find data of the East Accolade? You can find data of the East Accolade on Apple Music, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever other fine music is streamed. <laughs> yes. You can also find it on my phone. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, just don't take my phone, please, but it is on there. Um, I only have the... I have changed my email to teabags at wanderings, <laughs> wanderingsandwoolgathering.com. Uh, so it's the letter T, bags, at wanderings, and woolgathering.com. Fantastic. That name again and as... is T-Bags at... Yes, and we're currently working on a tagline for me, so that will be fun to release. This is a uh, show for <laughs> kids, fellas. Just remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, children. All right. Steve, and where I can you am, be found? Uh, <laughs> I can be found at uh, Foggy Spell on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, you can also find me at BreakTheFourth.com, writing and editing. And you can find our shows there as well, over at BreakTheFourth.com. Fellas, it was another great show. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And uh, we're, we're always plugging um, Paul's music, which is worthy of the plugs. But also, uh, the writing is, well, that you do and the other people do over there uh, is worth checking out. So after uh, that Smashing Pumpkins article got picked up and I started going there more, um, it's it's very interesting to read uh, all the different entertainment things that you guys have going on over there. Absolutely. You know what we're missing? What? A review of Data of the East Accolade. Hey, I think if we don't do a show on that, honestly. On what, Tony? Um, then I'll quit. I'll quit. I got in this to do that review. <laughs> this is, I show up every week and we don't do it. So <sighs> we'll throw them in in there for it sometime. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All I'm right. done talking. That's cool. it for this week. We will see you next week for episode five and DJ Mugs and Cypress Hill. See you next time. Bye. Hey, peeps. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, hit the like button below. Also, please be sure to comment to expand on the conversation. We look forward to your thoughts on the topics we cover in the world of music. And be sure to hit that subscribe button. You'll be updated with more episodes in the future. Thanks again, and catch you next week. Bye.